Hello everyone, this is Dr. Alex Vasquez with another edition of what I call Nutrition 101 Cubed, where I start with a basic concept and then try to advance that uh, and connect it with whatever is kind of current in clinical practice or new research. What I'm going to focus on today is the role of vitamin D, uh, somewhat against infections, but mostly focusing on autoimmune disease, which as I'm sure most of you know is one of my favorite topics. Some of you might recognize this background from my books uh, because it's one of the uh, reminders or graphic uh, images that I use in order to recall one of the acronyms within my functional inflammology protocol. I'll touch on that a little bit later. What I talked about last time in this series was the use of the amino acid NAC to block a specific inflammatory pathway called mTOR and how that was relevant in rheumatic disease and to a lesser extent but still significant in psychiatry. What I'm going to do right now is just kind of overview this series again since it's new to most of you. The idea is just to start with a basic concept or topic and then kind of advance that to the next level. I try to keep these pretty short, uh, about 15 minutes, maybe 15 slides or so. Uh, today I'm mostly going to focus just on uh, about two articles that I think are important, but I am going to review the information from last time as well, and I'll try to cover that within uh, maybe about two minutes or so. So all of my disclosures and copyrights are mentioned on this page. Uh, you're welcome to stop the presentation at any time uh, if you want to read things word for word, but I'm not going to read things word for word so that we can continue to make progress. What we talked about last time was the use of NAC against autoimmunity, specifically by blocking a pathway called mTOR, which stands for the mechanistic target of rapamycin. We also contextualize that information by talking about some of the other mechanisms and benefits of NAC in clinical care. And then I introduced the topic of mTOR and talked about why that's important now. And then we got into more details and other ways of looking at that through various ways of defining mTOR, uh, looking at its uh, mechanistic pathways and also its, of course, clinical relevance, looking at things that activate it or things that inhibit it. Uh, again, that video, the one that you're looking at actually right now, these slides are available online. You're welcome to take a look at that. Uh, this is just kind of a quick review and reminder of what we talked about last time. And that'll kind of set the stage for the use of nutritional supplements against autoimmunity. Uh, in this case, you can see, for example, how mTOR activation leads to autoimmune type inflammation. And that autoimmune inflammation actually leads back to mTOR activation. So you definitely start to see a vicious cycle here. This is substantiated actually quite well by several case reports, uh, this being one of them. Uh, this was followed by a case series that was actually quite nice. And then a really uh, well or orchestrated and mechanistic study was published here in Arthritis and Rheumatology in 2012, September. Uh, as I mentioned before, I consider this to be a major study with a lot of really important clinical implications. So again, I invite you to look at the more uh, extensive review uh, that I published recently online in video format. So moving past uh, some of this information and eventually making our way towards uh, the treatment of autoimmunity with vitamin D, I think something important that I posted within the presentation last time, which is also relevant for this current presentation on vitamin D, is that I provided some perspectives and counter arguments. And you're going to see uh, when we get to the vitamin D section that the counter arguments uh, I think are important to consider and we need to have a forum for considering those counter arguments. That's why I included that information in this presentation on NAC and mTOR and I'm going to include a space for perspectives and counter arguments in the upcoming conversation on vitamin D as well. So we looked at a lot of this information again here as part of my uh, information against uh, infectious diseases. I recently published a antiviral strategy and immune nutrition strategy uh, as a book, as a separate book uh, from most of my larger works. We looked at some of the ethical considerations, which again are relevant not only for NAC, but also for vitamin D uh, and of course medical care in general. Uh, I'm, of course, very interested in this topic of microglial activation. We talked about that last time. I will, of course, talk about that in some upcoming presentations as well. So let's talk about vitamin D against autoimmune disease. Most of you know I published a major monograph in Alternative Therapies in Health and Medicine in 2004. 
Uh, that was followed by an article that was published on the Lancet website, uh, an article that we published in the British Medical Journal. I also included a lot of that information in a postgraduate CME monograph that I published uh, with the Institute for Functional Medicine. Uh, also in that same year, 2008, we published a clinical trial in Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. And I've continued to advance that work uh, again into my most recent protocol, which is represented by this book, Functional Inflammology. But for the most part, when it comes to my vitamin D work, I still consider this monograph from 2004 to be representative of my uh, opinions and perspectives at that time as well as now. So even though the science has advanced, I think we captured a lot of the knowledge about vitamin D within this article, even though it was back in 2004. And here we are 11 years later and that article still stands quite strong. I've recently decided to review some of this information because I've seen uh, either in email conversations or online some what we might call controversy about vitamin D. Some people are advocating, uh, despite all of the proof of the benefit of vitamin D, they're advocating that vitamin D should actually be withheld from patients who have infectious diseases and autoimmune diseases. I believe that that is completely wrong. I think that is a misinterpretation of any available data, and I don't think it's in accord with the weight of the data. And I've represented my opinions here in this article recently published in the International Journal of Human Nutrition and Functional Medicine. The background, as you might suspect, is that vitamin D has many benefits uh, against inflammatory diseases, autoimmune diseases, infectious diseases. It's remarkably safe and it's remarkably affordable. So I think it's very controversial that some people would say that we should withhold vitamin D from people who stand a very good chance of actually benefiting from this. So based on that, I reviewed my position on this and I invite anyone to write a counter article uh, or a counter argument against uh, the science that I've presented very briefly uh, and to articulate their position on this that would need to include uh, mechanistic considerations and ethical risk-benefit ratios, cost-effectiveness, etc. which has already been published in favor of vitamin D and I'll show you an example of that. Let's look at this article on vitamin D supplementation on inflammatory and hemostatic markers and disease activity in patients with lupus. This was published in Journal of Rheumatology 2013. As you can see here, this was a clinical trial with 267 patients. These patients were engaged for 12 months. They received 2,000 international units per day of vitamin D. Many of us would say that that's not enough and that they should have used a higher dose, maybe 4,000 or 10,000 international units per day. But uh, as medical progress tends to be kind of slow, they used 2,000 international units per day. And what they found was statistically significant and clinically important reductions in inflammatory mediators and disease activity. In fact, if you look at this chart here, you'll see that all of the markers of inflammatory activity went down. The only one that went up was this one called C4, and you actually want that one to go up. When this C4 number is higher, that actually indicates less inflammatory activity, specifically through reduced breakdown by immune complexes. If you look at disease activity markers, those were also improved. So not surprisingly, the authors concluded that vitamin D seems to have important immune inflammatory modulatory roles that may benefit musculoskeletal and cardiovascular manifestations of SLE and quote we recommend routine assessment of vitamin D levels and adequate supplementation of vitamin D in patients with lupus. Now again according to my work we would suggest that 4,000 to 10,000 international units per day would be physiologically appropriate. I think that their use here of 2,000 units was a little bit on the low side but they still got excellent results. So again here, vitamin D was proven to provide safe, inexpensive, highly important benefits for these SLE patients. And the conclusion from the authors, which I also support, is that clinicians should use this therapy routinely unless specifically contraindicated in specific cases. Again, I've articulated that argument here in a recent article, International Journal of Human Nutrition and Functional Medicine. This article is available for free online. and. You're welcome to download that and share it with your friends. And for anybody who wants to publish a counter argument, you're certainly welcome to do that as well. And we'll be happy to publish a good articulate and well-written article. So that is my brief conversation about the use of vitamin D against autoimmune conditions. Most of these autoimmune conditions have a infectious component to them, meaning that they are triggered and promoted at least in part by underlying infectious diseases. So for example, 
In my opinion, when we show that vitamin D has anti-rheumatic benefits, when we show that vitamin D is beneficial in these autoimmune conditions, we're also substantiating its use against infectious diseases because many of these patients do have infectious diseases and I strongly believe that when we use vitamin D in these patients, we're not simply using vitamin D as we would a drug against the autoimmune condition, we're also suppressing or uh, promoting the clearance of those subclinical infections that are actually driving the disease process. This is part of my protocol, which I call nutritional immunomodulation. The acronym is recalled by the little jingle plaid figs, and that's why you're looking at plaid and figs here. That's part of my nutritional immunomodulation protocol. Again, that's described in functional inflammology. It's also described in a shorter book called Inflammation and Autoimmune Solutions. The full version right now is either an excerpt called Functional Medicine Rheumatology version 3.5 or the full 900 page version which is Naturopathic Rheumatology version 3.5. So again thank you for your attention during this very brief video. What I tried to do was talk about vitamin D against autoimmune conditions and mention a little bit about the role of vitamin D against infections. Thanks for your attention and look forward to seeing you next time.